All right, are you ready to get started today? Yes. First of all, the best thing to do is to start with Happy Pride Month, everybody! <laughs> pride Month, aren't you glad? I mean, the world is telling us we ought to have pride. So, Pride Month, how many of you have seen that? Pride Month, how many of you put the word together? Two different words. What's the middle word in that? Demon. That's just a coincidence, isn't it? When you talk about them, they show up. <laughs> so, is that just a coincidence or what? The whole thing was not a coincidence. I don't, I don't know, man. Um, I don't know about you, but I always thought that pride was a sin. Did you ever heard that? So why is everyone running around saying pride, pride, pride? I'm just, I'm kind of, I'm trying to figure this out. Have you ever figured it out? I'm still not figuring it out. But let's go to Job chapter 41. What does the Bible say about pride? And, and who is the one behind pride? If you know your Bible, you know who the first person was that was full of pride? It's called envy, too. He was envious, and he was prideful. And that, of course, would be Lucifer. And that's the first sin, even before Adam and Eve, was pride. And in Job chapter 41, God starts talking about verse 1, Leviathan. Now, Leviathan was a real animal, I believe. I think he was probably a dinosaur, from what it says here. But he's talking about the animal, but he's saying, now that's what the devil's like. And look what it says. So as you're reading this passage, you're reading God saying the devil's like this. And verse 34, And beholdeth all high things, he, who is this, Satan, or the devil, Leviathan, even Satanists, they refer to Satan as Leviathan. Have you noticed that? Have you ever seen that? That's weird. Maybe they know something. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of what? Just saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, enough of that, right? But is pride a sin? Well, this week uh, I was thinking of starting the book of Matthew verse by verse, but I just couldn't get it together. I've got so much coming up. And what an awful week. And yet, what a wonderful week, amen? We got to put out the movie, the video about the street preaching in Beale Street. But we had a lot of uh, problems going through that. I think it was a spiritual attack on us. And then, after we uploaded the video, they immediately said, Oh, no, no, copyrighted music. <laughs> and so, we had that music. We had a right to use that. Yeah. We had to go through the whole politics thing and write on the bottom the music and everything. So, it seems like the, the, the devil doesn't like it when you begin to... Show the truth. And that's something. But anyway, enough of that. Last week, what did we look at? We looked at your gifts. And so I thought about it this week, and I thought, well, I guess I'll just talk about this, and that'll give me a week off. I'll be gone next week, and then when I come back, we'll start on the book of Matthew. But I couldn't finish last week's sermon the way I wanted to, because last week we looked at your gifts. God gives everyone a gift. God wants you to use that gift, right? And I tried to encourage you. To think about it all this week and think, what is your gift? But just because we have a gift doesn't mean we use it for the Lord. We've got to surrender to Him. And just because we have that gift doesn't mean we can be used to our full potential until we do what? We surrender. And so we might have a gift, but we also have a bunch of these. Don't we? If I can spell it right. Uh, we have a bunch of these. <laughs> so Sometimes, because we have these, we don't, we don't live up to our full potential, do we? Now, a sin is not a fault, right? You can have a fault that's not a sin. So, I went from faults to sins today. I'm going to talk about sins. But I thought about this. Before God can get, get the use of us out of our full potential, we've got to set aside a sin in our life. And I want the best for you all. And I want you to use your gift. But also see that the Lord doesn't want to use a dirty vessel. He mm -hmm. wants to use a clean vessel. Amen. Um, you go to the dishwasher and you open it up and the dishes are dirty. It hasn't been done. Do you take that and, and use that glass? It's a dirty vessel. You hit start. Then you come back. Oh, it's clean. Now I can use it. The Lord's the same way. He wants us clean. So what do we need to do? We need to get right. And we need to be clean and serve the Lord by sacrificing for him. We need to get right. We need to live right. And we need to get the sin out of our lives. And so, what is Christianity? Well, Christianity is founded on the three most important things, is the way I explain it. Salvation. Well, salvation, we know, is through the blood. So how important it is to preach the blood. Amen? 
And then we have the book, the, the uh, scriptures. What book is that we believe today? It's the KJV, amen? amen? I don't believe in other versions because I see a lot of missing words. Amen. KJV. KJV. Blood. Oh, yeah, amen. I'm thinking otherwise. Thank you. The blood, not the bluke. The blood. Hey, the the book. And then sanctification. The blue. The blessed hope is what that makes me think about. The blessed hope, which is what? The rapture. Boy, don't ever take away from me my hope of getting out of this crazy, mixed up world, right? So, the blood, the book, the blessed hope. So, we have salvation. We've got to preach that right. We've got to preach faith in the blood like the Bible does. We've got scriptures. We want to make sure we have the right Bible, not some version that is based upon the wrong manuscripts that takes out whole verses like most modern Bibles. And we need to make sure sanctification. Now, what does sanctification mean? Well, sanctification means being clean. It also means being separated. So separate, I don't know if I can spell separate, I'll just abbreviate so I don't get myself in trouble, you know, but separated. And it's being holy. What does it mean to be holy? Holy means set apart and, and separated, meet for the master's use. So God wants to call people and gives them a gift. Now, should we go out and sin and use the gift God's given us? Or should we set aside, lay aside that sin and then be used of the Lord more because we're trying to live right and do right? So let's start today in Galatians chapter 6. And I started thinking about this, and I thought, I'll, I'll talk about our faults. That's what I was going to talk about in this sermon, is the faults. But I couldn't figure out any faults that I had. So I went and asked my wife, and I couldn't shut her up. I mean, she just kept telling me. And I said, man, I don't want to go there. So I said, hey, let's just talk about our sins. And uh, let's see. Let me ask you this. Is there any sin in your life? No, Brother Breaker, I'm sinless. Well, then you just lied, didn't you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh we all have something in our life that we're ashamed of, that we do. Mm -hmm. Well, the worst part, though, is we don't want other people to see our sin, but we don't care if God sees it. Why don't you care more about what God sees mm -hmm. than what other people see? That's right. Isn't that something to think about? So God gave us all these gifts, but often we are so full of faults or sins that we don't live up to our full potential for Jesus. Let me say this when you're turning to Galatians chapter 6. Do you know what the easiest thing in the world to find is? What is the easiest thing in the world to find? Fault in somebody else. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to look at them and say, well, let me tell you what your problem is. Mm -hmm. You know what the hardest thing in the world to find is? Fault in yourself. <laughs> I've looked and I don't see anything wrong. Well, let's ask 12 other people and see what they say because they can sure tell you what. And sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. Because we judge poorly sometimes too, don't we? But isn't that funny how we justify our sins? And we often think, well, I'm not as bad as that guy over there. Um, it doesn't matter if you're better or worse. You're still a sinner. And you need to get rid of that sin from your life. So let's start in Galatians chapter 6. And you know, it's not easy. But it's easier if we help each other with the right spirit. I'm an ordained independent Baptist, okay? Okay. There's a joke that the independent Baptists eat their own young because they have a critical spirit. And all they do is go around and point out the faults and sins in others. <laughs> How does that help each other? Mm -hmm. They do it with a negative spirit and a negative, I mean, just negativity. No, let's positively say, hey, brother, I love you, but there's something that I'm worried about. Can I talk to you about it? I don't want to offend you, but I think I see this. How can I help you get that right? Wouldn't that be the right way to do it? Rather than say, you dirty, filthy pig! You're gonna, oh, you're, I mean, now I don't want to get right because you scared me off. You see what I'm saying? But if I take you and say, hey, can I help you with this thing that you're struggling with? Oh, this guy cares about me. Isn't that, that's why there's so few independent Baptist churches left in America because they run people off. So let's be true Christians and let's do like it says in this passage, bear one another's burdens. Amen? So Galatians chapter 6, let's read verses 1 through 10. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Hey, we can all be tempted, huh? You know, it's easy to stand up and, and say, look at that guy, he did this. Tomorrow you might do the same thing. Are you going to get up and say, hey, look at me, I did this? Or are you going to just zip? I've seen sins covered up in churches. 
I could tell you so many stories of pastors that have sinned and they covered it up. When you do it, they preach against it. But when they do it, don't tell anybody. No, you need to get right too. Amen? It says here, Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. <laughs> I sure don't want to think I'm something special because I don't. I just, oh. I hate to even watch my videos because I don't even like the way I look or sound or, or anything. But I just do what I can for the Lord. And I just feel like, oh, I'm nothing, man, because I feel like I should do better. I'm always trying to do better, but I feel like, well, if that's the best I can do, then God, please use it. But it says, but let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Now, do you rejoice in your sin? What is this rejoicing Paul's talking about? When I put aside my sin and do something for the Lord and he blesses it, woohoo, thank you, Jesus, because I know in a good conscience I did right and he blessed it. But if I'm sinning and then I go do something right, a lot of times I become a self-righteous Pharisee and start bragging on myself instead of bragging on Jesus. Is that what we should do? Should we make it about us? It shouldn't be about us. It should be about the Lord. We should always put him forth first. But let's put aside the sin and be a clean vessel used by the Lord. For every man shall bear his own burden. Now, isn't that funny? It says, bear you one another's burdens. And then it says, for every man shall bear his own burden. <laughs> Some people go, what a contradiction. No, ultimately, you're going to bear your own burden. But try to help others in their burdens. Because they're ultimately going to bear that themselves. But it helps to have somebody else there helping you to get away from sin. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm not telling you to go confess your sins to each other. In the book of James, it says to confess your faults. It doesn't say sins, it says faults. New versions change that to sins. That's where Catholics get confession from. But who was James written to? <laughs> so I'm not going to go around and confess my faults to people. But if we love each other, we should be honest with each other. And say, hey, I see you doing this, and that, that might not be a good thing to do. And vice versa. Tell me, if you see me say something or do something that I shouldn't, let me know, okay? Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. This is the law of sowing and reaping. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So this is the law of sowing and reaping. You go do wrong, wrong's going to come to you. You go reap good, good will come. And in the flesh, whatever you... Now, when we're saved, we don't give account for our sins, do we? Because they're under the blood. I'm going to show you those verses today. So thank God when I get to heaven, God won't bring up all my sins in the past. Because my sins are here. But when I get to heaven at the judgment seat of Christ, and there's that throne that he's sitting on, and I stand before the throne, I'm going to get rewards up there based upon my service. And if I did it in the flesh, I'm not going to get anything. The Bible says walk in the Spirit. If I did it in the Spirit, getting rid of my sins, getting away from the flesh, trying to do what God wants in the Spirit, I'm going to get some of these. But if I'm doing evil, I'm going to lose some of these. Do you guys understand that? I mean, I'm sure you do. But I've got a lot of new converts online that, that are still wanting to learn all this. So I want to get this out to you. But the law of reaping what you sow. All right? You're a Christian. And you go do an evil sin. Do you go to hell? No. no, because we're forgiven of all our sins. But what can happen? Rewards. You can pay here. It's already paid for there, so you're not going to pay for it. But you can sure. Let's say you do something wrong here, then you can get something right. Let's say you do drugs. Well, what's that going to do to your mind? What's that going to do to your body? What's that going to do to your health? It's going to mess you up. So you do reap what you sow. So I want the best for everybody. So I want everybody to live healthy and not do things like that that could affect their health and things like that and, and bring cancer and things like that. I don't, I don't want to see that. So continue reading here. It says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. I always think of that because we already have eternal life and we're saved. What is that saying? That's saying if I go out and evangelize and win somebody to the Lord, then now they have eternal life. Mm -hmm. And I'm supposed to do that in the spirit, not in the flesh. Did you all see us preaching on the street? I didn't see anybody in the flesh. I saw them all just repeating verses and giving Bible. 
And I was just like, wow, I got goosebumps watching. I've been out where guys are street preaching and they're calling women whores and stuff like that. And I'm like, dude, you're in the flesh. Uh, you're pushing people away. But if you just simply stick with the book, man, God can, can do something with that. Now it says here, the hardest verse in the entire Bible to follow, <laughs> verse 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing. Well, too late. There's my biggest fault right there. I'm always weary. I'm always tired. I feel like I'm always worn out. So how do I? I, I try. Well, I don't know how to obey that verse, okay? I've done my best. But I guess take a vacation every now and then. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Well, I haven't fainted yet, so I guess I'm doing right, okay? <sighs> No, 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 almost. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So are we supposed to go out and be hateful and mean and angry and evil toward other people? That's not what I see. That would be in the flesh. Do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Household of faith, what does that mean? We're all family in the Lord, aren't we? Wow, so we're supposed to love each other, help each other. And what are we supposed to help each other do? Get right and live right for the Lord so that we can be used by him even more. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. How is the best way to do that? The best way to do that is to always remember what Jesus did for you. What did he do for you? He sacrificed for you. So what should you do for him? Sacrifice for him, right? I mean, that's kind of what he wants, because if he did that for you, then he's kind of insinuating that, go do that for me, right? So how much do you love the Lord? The problem is, people love their flesh more than they love God. So they'll come over here, and they'll do whatever they feel like doing anytime they want, and they do it all for them. No, we should do it all for the Lord. We should walk in the spirit that we fulfill not the lust of the flesh. Is lust a sin? Yes. What is flesh backwards? Well, there's a thing in English language called a silent H. You ever heard of that? So let's spell this backwards. Oh, it's self. <laughs> huh. It's all about you, is it? And that's when it's easy to sin, when you make it all about you and pleasing you. Have you ever read Revelation chapter 4? I forget what verse it is, but Revelation 4 says, For thy pleasure we were and are created. That's in Revelation chapter 4. So why are we here on this earth? To please ourselves or to please God? So we push supposed to please God. Now, there's some things we can do in the flesh that are pleasing that aren't sin, that we can do. Get married and you'll learn all about that. But there's things also in the flesh that we can do that are sin. That please. Do, you, do you believe that sin is pleasing? The Bible says sin is pleasurable for a season. Amen. Why do people sin? Because it pleases their flesh. Should they? No. They should rather try and seek to please God. So there are things we can do that are right, that are fun, that we can be pleased by. But all too often we do the things that we shouldn't. And we get pleasure from doing evil. That's, that's awful. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 4. I just have a bunch of verses, okay? I didn't know what to do this week, so I just said, let the Lord speak to us from the Bible rather than me. So let's just go to a bunch of verses. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 4. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Let us what? Lay aside. Let us set aside our sins. We are that close to Jesus Christ coming back. You could probably give up something for him before he comes back. Amen. Amen. Something that you're doing that you know probably isn't right or you know is, is not a good testimony. You don't have to do that. You can give it up for the Lord and lay that aside, especially since he's coming back. Do you want him to come back and find you doing that? <laughs> oh, wow. What if you're sinning when the Lord comes back? You'd be like, oh, was that a trumpet sound? Oh, you know, have you ever mm -hmm. thought about that? I'm just saying, uh, look at verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author, now look at that. We, we went there this week's sermon. I don't know if you guys saw it, but what was it called? The author, of salvation. the author of salvation. Jesus is the author of salvation. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. What a conundrum that verse is. It says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured. He went through 
horrible, unspeakable pain and suffering. And the Bible says, and there was joy. Was he sadistic and he enjoyed pain? What was the joy of the cross for Jesus? Not the pain. It was you who got saved from it. So because he went through this, he was thinking, and it's all worth it for you if you get saved. That's the joy he was thinking of. Well, you get saved, and then you go sin. You think he still has joy, or he kind of goes, Woohoo, you got saved! Oh, what a disappointment. I sure don't want to be a disappointment for the Lord. I want to do right. What does it say here? Verse 4, For consider him that can endure such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Wow. Jesus Christ would rather die than sin. Do you have that same mindset? Years ago, I met a pastor, a preacher, who was a pastor for many years. I think he was in Texas. And he said, Brother Breaker, that verse, he showed me that verse. He said, the Christian's mindset is, and should be, I'd rather die than sin because I love Jesus that much. I never forgot that. You have not resisted unto blood. He shed his blood. He, he shed his blood rather than sin. What if he had sinned? All that would be for naught. How much do you love the Lord? Now I'm not telling you to go cut yourself and draw blood. <laughs> but I am saying, look at the picture of Jesus. He'd rather die than sin. Is that your mindset? That I love the Lord so much, I'd rather die than sin against him because I love him and what he's done for me? Well, it's getting awful quiet in here. Is the Holy Spirit touching you? <laughs> Is there some sin? See, I'm not mentioning any sins. That's the fun part. Because you have a conscience and you know in your head what those sins are that you're guilty of. And the Holy Spirit right now is saying, you need to stop this. You need to quit. Do you think you ought to be doing it? See what the Lord's doing through the Word here? But it's what He did for us. Now, what are you going to do for Him? Hmm. Have you set aside your sins for the Lord Jesus Christ? You should rather want to die than sin against the Holy God. That's what Jesus did. He did that for you. One of my favorite verses is 2 Timothy 2. And when we end here today, I'm going to go back to 2 Timothy 2 and read the rest of this. But I just want to read this one verse. 2 Timothy 2, 19. I had a friend one time who has recently passed away. And you remember people by some of the sayings that those people had. And his saying was this, keep your sinning to a minimal. I always thought, that's so wrong. His thought in his mind was, I'm going to sin, so I might as well sin as little as possible because I'm going to sin anyway. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, cut it out. Stop it. You should want to get to the point to where you are strong enough as a Christian that you can say no to sin. I wish that was possible. <laughs> I'm going to show you Paul. Paul couldn't stop sinning. And he was the greatest Christian that ever lived. But we should want that, that we'd rather die than sin. And we do our best to fight against sin. What did I tell you? 2 Timothy 2.19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, thank God for that, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. What is iniquity? Sin. So what does the Bible teach? Depart from sin. Get as far away from it as you can. Amen? Is that what the Bible teaches? Do you hear this preached in many churches today? No, many churches today are rejoicing in their pride. Mm. But, but I thought pride was just a sin. Mm. So, oh, well, you know, I'm not a Catholic, but even the Catholics believe in the seven deadly sins. Isn't pride one of them? Amen. I'm just, it's, I don't understand what's happening in the world today. But the Bible clearly teaches, get away from sin. Go to Romans chapter 6. I'm going to show you all the verses I can on get away from sin. Then I'm going to leave it up to you, see what you do. But you know what? When you hear a message like this, you can't claim ignorance anymore. And when you do sin and you do reap what you sow, don't blame Robert Breaker. Blame yourself. Because I warned you. But I love you. That's why I warned you. <laughs> Amen? If you love someone, you'll tell them the truth. Amen? Romans chapter 6, verse 11 through 18. Romans 6, 11. Likewise reckon. See? Paul was a southerner. Reckon. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead unto sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. How are we dead unto sin? Well, 
when we're saved, we're born again, and we have new life. We have spiritual life. And Paul is telling us that we're supposed to reckon the flesh dead. So it's like we have a grave here, and we put the flesh in the grave, and we cover it up, and now we walk on as the new creature, and we leave that back there. What do a lot of Christians do? They get a shovel, they start digging it back up again so they can fulfill the desires of that flesh. Leave it and let it lie. Put the flesh down, reckon the flesh dead. Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And it says there, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. That's what some people do. Well, I'm under grace, so I can do whatever I want. Well, you can, but should you? I can go rob a bank, but should I? Mm -hmm. So we should know right from wrong and do right. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're under grace. Yes, our sins are forgiven, but grace is not an excuse for sin. Amen? Amen. Are you with me? And look what it says here, verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, which ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. So are we free from sin? Spiritually, yeah. Our new creature is forgiven and we're washed in the blood. But we're living in this horrible old body that still has its desires. And sometimes we let it run things, don't we? But what did it say? It said, let not therefore sin reign. We have to let the Lord reign, not let the flesh reign. Amen? Amen. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. I'm basically, what I'm trying to do is just give you all the verses in the Bible that teach us not to sin as Christians in the hopes that you'll memorize these and learn these, and it will help you because it's a daily battle, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Against sin. Temptation is everywhere. You can't even drive down the highway without being tempted because they have a half-naked woman on a billboard and stuff like this. Temptation is everywhere. So we need to know these verses that will help us to fight the flesh. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness. It doesn't say get woke, does it? It says awake to righteousness, not get woke to things that might be sin. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So sin not. Twice in the Bible we've read sin not. That's not keep your sin to a minimum. That's don't sin. <laughs> That's what the Lord wants. He wants you to not sin. Let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. So I just want to encourage you to get away from sin because sin hurts you. But you know sin can also hurt others. If you do something wrong, that could affect people years later. Maybe even put them in hell. Have you ever thought about that? Mm -hmm. There might have been something you did in your life that somebody saw you do and thought, well, if he can do it, I can do it. Mm -hmm. And they went and did it because they learned it from you. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you could do right. And affect somebody else, and they're oh, he's a godly person that's living. I want to be like him. And do you see how you have an influence on others? Whew. All right, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Be ye angry and what? Sin not. So it's not a sin to be angry. I've heard people say it's a sin to get angry. Well, this isn't anger as in the fleshly anger, this is a spiritual, it's called righteous indignation. It is right to hate sin mm -hmm. and be angry against the sin that you see. Mm -hmm. Jesus had that. It says he looked about them in anger. Unless you have a new version. You know that's taken out of new versions? Mm -hmm. Isn't that something? But um, it says, be ye angry, okay? Righteous indignation towards sin. And sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. What's the difference between a saved man and a lost man? Well, one of the greatest differences is when you're saved, you can't enjoy sin. Mm -hmm. A lost person goes out and does sin 
And they have a conscience, so at first it bothers them, but the Bible talks about it being seared. Mm -hmm. The more they sin, the less it bothers them. When we get saved, we get the Holy Spirit inside of us, and when we sin, it grieves. Have you ever sinned after you were saved and you went, oh, you just felt like horrible? You know, that was the Holy Spirit. So a saved person can't really enjoy sin. They can sin, and they might enjoy it for a short time, but they're going to go home and cry their eyes out usually and feel horrible and feel bad. So don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Now look at verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking. See, it says anger. Yet in the last verse, it says be angry. Here it says don't be angry. What? There's, there's a physical, fleshly anger, but then there's the anger of the Spirit against sin. Do you see the two different angers? And one is righteous indignation, and that's okay. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. First um, John chapter 2. I just want to give you as many verses as I can, and then I can sit down and feel like I did the best I could today because we heard from the Lord, not just from me, okay? First John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. And I know you know these things, but it's good to be reminded. My dad used to say, the best way to learn is repetition, repetition, repetition. And then he'd ask me, son, how's the best way to learn? I said, repetition? He goes, wrong. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Now, what's the best way to learn, son? I go, repetition? Wrong. It's repeti and he made me say it three times because sometimes we hear it and it goes in here and out here. So we need to hear it over and over and over before sometimes it sticks. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation. Amen? Where else does that verse show up? Romans 3.25. Jesus is our propitiation. For our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The whole world can be saved. This is a very anti-Calvinistic verse. Because it says that the blood atonement, the propitiation, is for the whole world. Mm -hmm. So why don't they receive it? Because they reject it. They have free will, don't they? They don't want to. <laughs> oh, yeah. But what does he say there? He says that you sin not. God doesn't want us to sin. What if we do sin? Well, we're still forgiven, but we lose rewards. Mm -hmm. We lose joy because we grieve the Spirit. We also lose our testimony. When we go out and we do bad things, people see that. Mm -hmm. And they remember that. It's very hard to get your testimony back when you do something stupid, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's very hard. There's people in this world that I love, but I can no longer trust. And I separate myself from them. And they're just as saved as I am. Mm -hmm. Because they did something. Now I no longer can trust them. Maybe it's under the blood. Maybe God forgot it. Maybe they forgot it. <clears throat> but I'm always in the back of my mind thinking, is he going to do that to me again? Because he did it once. I wish he'd never done it so I could still trust him and fellowship with him. And, you know, like, so that makes me live every day going, man, I hope I don't do that to somebody else. Because I want them to know they can trust me. Well, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. So do you see the problem is sin? Old, old Pastor Ruffman used to say, life is short, death is sure. Sin the curse, Christ the cure. Amen. I like that saying. Now, go to uh, Colossians chapter 2. In verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened, that means brought to life, together with him having forgiven you all trespasses. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you what? All. A-L-L. -L. That's not the detergent that you wash your clothes with. All. That's every sin. Having forgiven you all trespasses. Isn't that wonderful that Jesus forgives all sins? You know it wasn't always like that. You know, it was different in the Old Testament. That's what we talked about this week. What did Jesus tell Peter? Peter says, how often should I forgive someone? Oh, 70 times 7, 490 times. So before Jesus died, you only had to forgive somebody 490 times. I was counting, man. You're at 489, brother. One more time. And no. But is that today? Does God only forgive us 490 times? No. All. Oh. Thank God that I know that all my sins. Now, some people look at that and go, well, then I can go do this, this, and this. You shouldn't. That's very selfish of you to want to use grace as an occasion for the flesh. No, I don't want to do wrong. I'd rather do right. So, 
It says there, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made show of them openly triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon. And on and on. I skipped the verse that I wanted, which was 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So thank God for the cross and what Jesus did for our sins. Go back to Galatians chapter 5. And uh, I had hoped to finish early today because we're still packing and getting ready for our trip. But I just want to give you these verses. Oh, good. I'm not doing too bad. I've got a couple more verses. Galatians chapter 5 and verse... I'm not doing too bad. Galatians 5, 13. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Man, that's a hard verse. I'm up here telling you, quit sinning and serve the Lord. And then the Lord says, by the way, serve other people too. It's easy sometimes to serve Jesus. It's hard to try to help other people. Sometimes they don't want help. Other times you help them until you're blue in the face. And they're ultimately making their decisions and they don't seem to do anything right. We had a friend who every time he made a decision, it was the wrong one. <laughs> and... Every time, though, before he makes his decision, he comes and asks you, what should I do? Well, if you do this, this will happen, so you need to do this. That person would always choose this, and then come back and complain to you about, oh, it's like, after a while, you're just like, hello, I told you that would happen, don't go do that, right? But people ultimately make their own decisions. I can't get mad at them. I gotta love them, gotta help them. Well, you know... <laughs> I wish everyone would just do right, don't you? Wouldn't the world be a great place if everyone just did right? But people don't do that. So don't use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But also make sure you don't not love one another and serve one another either. Make sure that you realize part of Christianity is trying to serve other people. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit that you should fulfill not the lust of the flesh. And for the spirit lust of against, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Here's the works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, cleanness, lasciviousness. That's unbridled sex is what that is. That's what people do nowadays, free love, they don't think anything about it, and yet in the Bible it's sin. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatreds, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Does that say they're going to hell? Well, if you're saved, you've already inherited the kingdom of God. Did you know that? The book of Luke, Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you. I already inherited it. What if I go do one of these stupid things? Did I just lose my salvation? No, I lost my reward. Because the Bible says that the rewards are my inheritance. When somebody dies, you get an inheritance, right? So I will lose some of my inheritance if I sin. But I can't lose salvation. So I want to stay away from it. I want to get as many rewards as I can. I want to live for Jesus. Do you use credit cards? I don't like credit cards, but you know the only reason why we use credit cards? To get the points. We're those kind of people that pay it every month so we don't have to pay interest. And then we get the credit card companies literally paying us through the points to use their, oh, they hate us. With, you know what they call us? The credit card company has a name for people like us. Freeloaders, they call us. <laughs> Meanwhile, if you get in debt to them, it's how much now? Like 30% you're paying every month or something? Or a year, APR? So the Bible says, using the world, but not abusing it. Because they sure want to abuse you, don't they? So it's not wrong to have a credit card if you pay it off every month and get the points. <laughs> it's so fun, man, to use a credit card. Like we bought a, our, our car, and we, we like, put on these three cards. And then we went home, there's thousands of points. We're like, well, I'll convert that into dollars. And we, we were so excited. So it's not wrong to use the world, but don't abuse the world. Well, you should have the same mindset with the Lord. Wow, the Lord saved me and I can get some rewards? That's what it's called, Visa Rewards. <laughs> you should get some rewards. You should have that mindset. What can I do for Jesus and do for others to get some points in that? 
Boy, where did I go? Man, I got off the topic there, didn't I? Um, so look what it says, the next part, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with all the affections and lusts. How you doing? Have you done that yet? Have you crucified your flesh and all the affections and lusts? Or are there still some addictions in your life? Is there still some lusts? Is there still some bad things that you do? Well, this verse says you, you're supposed to have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So why are you holding on to that one little thing? Why don't you set it aside for Jesus? Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. You know, it says we're not supposed to provoke one another. You know what that is? Like, make others mad and make them fight you. But there's a verse that says, provoking one another to good works. So I'm provoking you the right way today to try to do right. And I hope you do. I hope you do. Uh, let's go to, well, I, I just simply don't have time to read Romans chapter 7. But when you get a chance, read of all of Romans chapter 7, verse 1 through 25, where the Apostle Paul speaks from his heart and he tells you, the, would, the things that I would do, I don't. The things that I don't want to do, I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He says, I'm saved, but I still fall into sin, and I hate it, and I want to do right. How about you? Do you have that same mindset? Let's go to Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 7. And we just have a couple more verses. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 7. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. You know what's fun? Look up every time in the Bible where it says God forbid. That's a fun verse. And a fun Bible study. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Now this is spirit baptism, not water baptism. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. What is the Bible saying? It says we're crucified with him. Have you ever thought about a crucifixion? We're crucified with him. He put down his desire, which was what? He prayed in the garden. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So what was his will? Jesus was saying, I'd rather not do this, but Lord, because you want me to, I'll do it. I'll, I'll go ahead and go up there. And he was crucified. And the Bible says right here, we're crucified with him. Our flesh is supposed to be crucified. How do you crucify? Well, three nails and two pieces of wood, right? So can I crucify myself? Let me try. Can I get a nail? Boom, 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 put it through both my feet. Then I get the nail. It's kind of hard to hold it in the hammer, but somehow I managed to get it in. Now what do I do? <laughs> I can't pick up the hammer and the nail. I can't crucify myself. It's very hard without help. So what should I do? I should go to the Lord every day and say, Lord, help. I want to live right. I want to do right. The spirit that you put in me helps me. Help me, Lord, to crucify the flesh and not do what it wants to do. Do you do that? Do you pray? Do you say, Lord, help me to keep from sinning? Let's close with Colossians. Well, no, we still go into another verse. So let's go to Colossians first, then we'll close with 2 Timothy. But let's go to Colossians chapter 1. Do you even think about sin? Do you even think about how you look in the eyes of God? If you don't think about it now, you will then. Because the Bible says at the judgment seat of Christ, we won't see our sin, right? Because it's judged here. But our rewards, our service. The things that we do for us will burn up. The things that we do for Jesus will get a reward. So all these things here on the earth that you're doing for you, it's going to come up as smoke at the judgment seat of Christ. Smoke and more smoke. And heaven is filling with the smoke of, because you, hmm. I, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm scared. Did you know the Bible talking about the judgment seat of Christ says, therefore knowing the terror of the Lord? It's a terror to think about when I get up there at the judgment seat of Christ to see how much I did for me 
and how little I actually did for Jesus. And what I did for me is smoke. And I'll probably be like, <coughs> you know. So that's why I'm starting the Black Powder Channel. I figure if it's going to go up and smoke up there, I'm just going to up and smoke down here too and shoot some black powder. But think about these things. You think, well, it's, I'll do whatever I want, whenever I want, and I'll never have to face judgment because it's all under the blood. Well, someday there'll be a lot of smoke on your behalf because you didn't care enough about Jesus to think about it now. You say, Lord, what can I do now to set aside my sins to please you more? Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 9. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Mortify means to kill. Is he telling us to commit suicide? No. He's telling us to reckon the flesh dead. Leave it in the grave. Don't resurrect it and sin. What are the things that we're to mortify? Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For these things say the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in, in the which ye also walk sometime when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off that all these Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So put off the old man. We're saved. We're in the new man. Don't go back to the old man. Don't go back to your sins. Don't do evil. Okay, now let's close with 2 Timothy. Have I helped you today? I hope so. Uh, when you preach like this, people say, well, he doesn't like me. He's just putting me down. Have I put you down? Or have I told you that I care? And I'm trying to help you bear your burden of sin. And I'm trying to help you have a good life and a long life. Because the less you sin, the more healthy you'll be, the more happy you'll be, the better testimony you'll have. Things will just go way better for you because you'll sleep at night knowing, well, at least I did the right thing. Hmm. Have you ever done something wrong and then try to sleep at night and it bothers you? Mm -hmm. You can't sleep. Mm -hmm. That's no way to live. It's always good. Like they say, a, a good conscience sleeps in a thunderstorm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's finish up. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 9. Yeah, excuse me. 2 Timothy. There we go. 2 Timothy 2. I'm like, what? That's not what I had written here. 2 Timothy 2, 20 through 26. We'll put this all together right here. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. Now, verse 19 is where it says, depart from iniquity. Verse 20, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, there it is, sanctification, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. God's given you a gift we talked about last week. All right? Now get rid of all the dirt. Get rid of all the bad stuff. Be an honor, honorable vessel for the Lord to use. And be sanctified. And then you'll be meat for the master's use. And then he can use you. He can use you. Amen? I want to be meat for the master's use. Do you? For the master. Who's the master? Jesus. You know what the greatest prayer you can pray is after you're saved? Lord, use me however you want so that you get the glory. Mm -hmm. Okay? Then we continue there. Where were we? Verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace upon them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. How do you call upon the Lord? Well, it's from the heart. Amen. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. That's what I'm trying to be. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If you're living a sinful lifestyle and you're truly saved, you're opposing yourself. You are your own worst enemy. And because I care about you, I'm trying to warn you. Because you're probably going to hurt yourself. 
with your sin. Because you reap what you sow. And you might even hurt me. <laughs> I don't want to be hurt. I want you to do right so I don't get any of your little fallout, right? I want to be as far away from nuclear fallout as I can be. Mm. The Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom we receive. So if you're living in sin and you're doing wrong, his judgment's going to fall on you. If I'm standing too close, maybe some of that falls on me. Uh -huh. I'm going to get as far away. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible tells us to separate it from every brother that walketh disorderly. There's a reason for that. We've had to separate from some people over the years, my wife and I. Well, it says here in verse 25, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. That's important to have, patience. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Where are you right now? Are you serving the Lord and doing your best to get away from sin? Or are you in sin and doing something evil and wicked and sinful? Well, you reap what you sow. That judgment might come very soon. You might have been taken by the devil in a snare. A snare is a trap. Maybe the devil's trapped you. And you know why. It's your fault because of your sin. What do you need to do? You need to repent. That means change your mind. You need to change your mind and go, man, I'm, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to do right. You say, well, it's hard because I'm always tempted. Well, there's other brothers that are here to help you. We will do anything we can to help you get out of sin. Mm -hmm. What can we do to help? So last week we talked about your gifts. This week I kept thinking the opposite. What are our faults? But I said, no, I'm not going to talk about faults because you can have a fault that's not a sin. Like you can be ugly, it's not your fault. Right, <laughs> but but sins. Let's let's talk about sin. Get rid of those sins in your life and come to Jesus, and then see what He can do with you. The world has yet to see. An old famous preacher said, "The world has yet to see a man that has fully surrendered to Christ and see what God can do with such a person, because we're all still doing something we shouldn't." <laughs> The world has yet to see a man that has fully surrendered to Christ and been used by him completely. Because we're always our own worst enemy. I don't know what else to do. I guess we'll just pray. I hope this was a blessing to you. I hope this spoke to somebody's heart and helps you to get right this week and do right. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come and study your word. Lord, thank you for giving us the warnings. Thank you for giving us the verses. Lord, thank you for giving us yourself. Mm. and showing us as an example how we should be. And Lord, we should follow you and uh, sacrifice for you because you sacrificed for us. Help us, God, to get that sin out of our lives so we can be a better Christian, be used by you more, and be a better testimony. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Should we take any questions or anything? It's getting pretty late. So. We have a question on TikTok. Real quick. Um, you have a viewer right now that says that is asking... Is the book of James a tribulation book? Is the book of James a tribulation book? Let's go to James chapter 1 and verse 1. Very quickly, I mean, I, I don't mind taking questions, but I know everybody's probably tired. No, I'm fine. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> 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 it goes like, oh, I'm good. Let's go another three hours. Yeah, let's go three more hours. We'll end in song. James chapter 1 and verse 1. Now, who is the book of James written to? It tells us in the very first verse. Now, Martin Luther, years ago, he said something about the book of James that people haven't forgotten. And James... James is very different than the doctrine of Paul. And when they asked Martin Luther, what, what do you do with James? He goes, I don't know, man. I wish I could light my stove with it. What was he saying? He said, I wish I could rip it out of the Bible and throw it away because it doesn't line up with the rest of the Bible. He didn't know what to do. You know what that was? That was confession. I don't know how to rightly divide, unfortunately. So how do we rightly divide the book of James? Why is this doctrine different than Paul? Because James was written first in the New Testament. That's my belief. And I think as you read it and you look at the rest of the Bible, you can't help but come to that conclusion. Because, let's see if I have room. Oh boy, here we go. Uh, let me erase the old beginning month. I mean, uh, that's the thing up here. When the church started, we're going to read verse 1 here in a second. All right? Up shows Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. First comes John the Baptist, announcing him, then Jesus. 
Jesus in his earthly ministry said, I came not but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus came only to Israel, he says. The church gets started, and in the early book of Acts, it's only to Jews. It's not till Acts 9 that, that Paul is saved. And then from then on, it's all about Paul, and he's going more to Gentiles. Of course, he goes to Jews first. But God starts forming more of the New Testament doctrine through Paul. So when was the book of James written? It wasn't James the Lord's brother. A lot of your so-called commentaries get that wrong. It's the other James of Peter, James, and John. And Peter wrote a book, James wrote a book, and John wrote a book. Those were the ones that were always next to Jesus, if you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So this James wrote that book when the early church was only Jews and there weren't any Gentiles saved yet. That's the only way you can look at the book of James and understand it. Because God gave Paul something different in Acts 13, 38, and 39, and that is we're justified by faith, not by works. Do you know what James says? James says we're justified by works and not by faith. Why is there a contradiction there? Because James was written here to these people. And the doctrine of the New Testament hadn't been set in stone yet. Now, read James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So who is the book of James written to? Israel. The twelve tribes scattered abroad. I've had people tell me, well, that book is written to me. Okay, which one of those twelve tribes are you from then? That book is right here. Now, does that mean we can't take anything from the book of James? No, there's a lot of good stuff in the book of James, but we rightly divide it, and there's some stuff we can apply here, but there's a lot of stuff we understand is going to be after the rapture in the tribulation when God goes back to dealing with Israel again. And now when you read the book of James, you go, wow, there's a lot of stuff that sounds like it's going to take place in the tribulation. For example, I forget what chapter it is. I think it's toward the end of chapter 5 or 6. When it talks about, okay, it's the last chapter. Look over there, the last chapter. James chapter 5, and look at verse 17. Elias, which is Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. <laughs> Former and latter rain. Three and a half years of no rain. Well, you know the tribulation is three and a half years, and three and a half years, it's seven years old. And the Bible says that Moses and Elijah will show up in the tribulation. So the book of James has what I call a dual application. A lot of it is dealing with this, because this is the parenthetical, because they rejected their Messiah. But we can take some of that and try to apply it to the doctrine of today, but not all of it. There's some troublesome things in the book of James. So the best way to Read the book of James, just go through and read it, apply to us what we can apply to us, but understand that a lot of it applies to the tribulation. And then it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. And remember in the book of Acts, James was killed very early. That James carried cut his head off. So I bet he wrote that book and then they cut his head off, and everyone, that's all they had was the book of James. Then Paul comes along, and my belief is he wrote the book of Hebrews first. And so it was still the Jews. Then he comes along and sees, oh, God's saving Gentiles now, so he wrote Romans and Philemon. Now, in the in uh, 2 Timothy, toward the end of his ministry, Paul says this, when you come and see me, Timothy, bring the parchments. Mm -hmm. What's a parchment? A very, very, very old piece of paper. If he wrote Hebrews first, he could have said, bring me that parchment that I wrote to those Jews. Because he said, I want to add something to it. And give it to, to the Gentiles to read too. Go to Hebrews, the last part of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews has 13 chapters. Chapter 13 looks like it was added by Paul, because he would have been the author, toward the end of his ministry. So I teach that Paul wrote chapter 13 before he died. Because clearly it's Paul. He says, They of Italy salute you. The end of the, of the and, and it says these things. Grace be with you all. He says, Timothy, verse 23, at the end. But if you take chapter 13 out, and it was originally written, Hebrews, with only 12 chapters, 
<laughs> how many tribes of Israel? Twelve. And how does it end if 13 wasn't there? For our God is a consuming fire. Mm. What a way to end a book. By the way, you don't accept the Messiah, you'll go to hell. But then he adds on chapter 13 because he wanted them to read this book to the Gentiles. Because if you read the book of Hebrews, this book is amazing. The book of Hebrews tells you all about, the first eight chapters is all about who Jesus is. And then the last couple of chapters are all about what Jesus did and how he is the one, the author of eternal salvation. Mm -hmm. So that book is an amazing book for us all to read. But it also has some application for over here. Because it's called the book of what? Hebrews. There's a place in Hebrews where it says, if you could lose your salvation, you can't get it back. Mm -hmm. Now, can we lose our salvation today? Paul says, no, we're sealed till the day of death. Right. When could there possibly be a time when someone could lose it and never get it back? What if someone over here took the mark of the beast? Now, they can't get it back. So do you see there's a double application of James and Hebrews toward over here? But we can also glean from these books what was taking place in the early church and the things that they knew. And then Hebrews, Paul gives us even more information about it's through the blood. Paul uses three terms with the word eternal. Eternal redemption, eternal salvation, and eternal life. Or eternal spirit. Yeah, eternal spirit. So in that book of Hebrews, he's telling us about when you're saved, you're saved eternally. But there's going to be a time when it goes over here and it changes. So... Hope that answered that question. One, one thing to add to that, yeah. for, for people that don't understand the parenthetical period, if the beginning of that parentheses, if you just think of it as the pause button was pushed on that, yeah. on that, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, That's that program, plan. that program to the Jews, the pause button's hit and it's unpaused whenever the rapture happens. So there's your pause button, and there's your play. So it was playing along, and then they rejected their Messiah, so God hit pause. And now we're getting saved today through the Gospel of Paul, and then all of a sudden God's going to unpause with the rapture. And, and then all play. the books that are to the Jews go back are in play again. Yep. So that's a good thing to know. Most people don't know that. They don't even read the very first verse of a book. I'm not one of the 12 tribes, are you? Mm-mm. -mm. So does that mean we throw the book out and put it in our fire? No, we read it because there's a place in it where it talks about being born again. <gasps> How is that possible? Because Jesus said you must be born again. And in the early church, when they were still only Jews, realized, oh, well, if we believe that Jesus is the Messiah, then we get the Holy Spirit and we're born again. Well, it wasn't always like that because they rejected their Messiah. So Paul's teaching was now if you'll trust the blood, then you're born again. So come and trust what he did, not just who he is. But it's a great verse to talk about being born again. No, a lot more we can so do. there's only one thing, and it's not like a real question. They just want to know which King James Version Bible study would you recommend, like a study book, Bible for King James? Well, which Bible? Well, a lot of people now are saying use the Ruckman Reference Bible, which is okay, I guess. But I remember being in Bible school and Ruckman saying, I will never do a, a Ruckman Reference Bible. And from what I've heard, the scuttlebutt behind the scenes of people I've talked to, he never finished. He started on it because people wanted it and never finished. And it sounds like, to me, putting pieces together that other people finished Ruckman's Reference Bible and put their notes in. So I got the Ruckman's Reference Bible and I was very disappointed of all the things he taught in class that weren't in his Bible. <laughs> and especially in, in the notes about the blood, there wasn't a lot of good stuff. Um, there's another one called the Common Man's Reference Bible, which is Brother Hoffman's. And uh, I was up there preaching for him. That's the church that I was in preaching. And uh, I, I would recommend that one before I recommend the Ruffman's Reference Bible. I really would. Because um, the Common Man's Reference Bible has a lot of good notes in it. Um, maybe someday we'll have the Breaker Reference Bible. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I don't know, man. That, you know how much time that would take to put together? I, I've got other things to do. i got a Black Powder channel i got to put on YouTube. <laughs> you, and are cool and axes, too. you got a university to do, too. Yeah, we, got, we want to start a, a King James Bible Institute, is what we're going to call it, kingjamesbibleinstitute.com or .net, I forget. And uh, right now, all we have to offer is verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through the whole New Testament, minus Mark and Luke and Matthew. So when we finish our study on Matthew, we'll, we'll be able to offer that as the courses, Then slowly we'll be adding other courses as well. 
and you can do the online King James Bible Institute. So won't that be wonderful? But the Lord will probably come back first. But if not, that's our goal, is we'll eventually have the, the free, you get that? Free online Bible Institute. Isn't that amazing? Buy the truth and sell it not. That's what the Bible says, so I, I figure we'll just do it first. Amen. Anybody else? Thank you for being here, and you'll be ready next week. It's next week already? Yes. <laughs> if you want, we'll put a microphone in the bathroom and you can preach from the shower. I'll be like, praise the Lord, everybody. I'll see you in the shower while we're Praise here. God. Anybody else? Yeah. Thank you for the visitors coming. You're welcome to come anytime. Hope to come back. And uh, great meeting y'all. And uh, amen. Appreciate you coming too. And I guess we're done. So I'm going to put Paul on the spot here. Paul, would you pray for us to close us? Holy and righteous Father in heaven, Father, we're so thankful for this day, for the freedom we have to gather here to study the portion of your word. Father, we pray that the scriptures we can apply in our everyday lives. Father, we're so thankful for your precious son sent to this earth to go to the cross, shed his blood for the permission of our sins. Father, Father, please go with us, please be with the travelers in your son's precious name. Amen.